the Ganaka Dude. Welcome to Damn Weird. I would appreciate if you could please go over and click on the subscribe and uh, hit the notification so you can know next time we have something new coming on. And uh, sorry for the uh, interruption, but back to the show. Today we're going to discuss the Ganaka Dit, giant sturgeon, as science calls it. Also, it has a few other terms, but uh, I'll go with what the Alaska natives call it. Sturgeon have been referred to as both leviathans and the Methuselahs of freshwater fish. They are among the largest fish. Some beluga sturgeon in the Caspian Sea reportedly attain over 18 feet and 4,400 pounds, while the Kaluga in the Amur River, similar length and over 2,200 pounds weight, have been reported. They have also amongst the longest living fishes, some living well over 100 years and attaining sexual maturity at 20 years or more. The combination of slow growth and reproductive rates and the extremely high value placed on mature egg-bearing females makes sturgeon particularly vulnerable to overfishing. It's not a good evolutionary step to uh, have tasty eggs, as the chicken. Sturgeon appeared in the fossil record some 245 to 208 million years ago, presumably near the end of the Triassic, making them among the most ancient of fishes. True sturgeon appear in the fossil record during the upper Cretaceous. In that time, sturgeons have undergone remarkably little morphological change, indicating their evolution has been exceptionally slow and earning them in formal status as living fossils. But I also find if you find a species that doesn't evolve anymore, that's because they've reached the peak. The crocodile and the alligator and the sturgeon, jellyfish. These are all things that haven't changed for millions and millions of years. Their status as living fossils explained in part by the long generation interval tolerance for wide range of temperature and salinity, lack of predators due to size and bony plated armor or scoots, and the abundance of prey items in their benthic environment. Although their evolution has been remarkably slow, they are a highly evolved living fossil and do not closely resemble their ancestor. They do have, however, still share several primitive characteristics. The earliest reports of this monster living in an Alaskan lake came from the native Tlingit people who tell stories of the creature referred to as Ganekadut. Or it was described as a large water dwelling animal with a head and tail similar to that of a wolf and a body like an orca. The Ganekadut was depicted as a fish god and was recorded in the pictographs along the Alaskan and British Columbian coast. Other early reports of the monster came from the native Aluit people who tell stories of the creatures they call the jig ik -nak. A fish-like monster reported to travel in groups and attack canoes and kill warriors. Creatures were feared and not hunted by the Aluit. This sparked interest in others as pilots and fishermen began to wonder what the creatures were. Many more sightings were reported as people began to fly low over the lake for the purpose of seeing these monsters fish. Consistent reports of large dull aluminum colored fish were coming in by the late 50s. Soon enough attention was brought to the subject that in 1979 the Anchorage Daily News offered a sum of 100,000 to anyone who could prove conclusive evidence proving the fish's existence. The existence or evidence is yet to be proved as sightings have slowed in the recent years. In 1942, Babe Alliesworth and Bill Hammersley reported seeing a large, dull, aluminum-colored fish from their plane. This encouraged others to come forth with sightings and more information. 1963, bi biologists reported seeing a 25 to 30 foot fish from overhead. It did not come up for air. Now, what's important about that is, means it wasn't a whale. 1967, Alaska missionary Chuck Karpatchets has seen the monster twice. Once he was flying over a float plane and he saw a large animal in the water. 
He got on the radio and tried to call some other people around to try to see and verify it, but no one got there in time. One of the friends went trawling for it. He took a 516 stainless steel cable, put a number two tuna hook on it, and baited them with caribou and tied it off the struts of his float plane. He was drifting and sitting out on the float. All of a sudden, the plane gave a big jerk, knocking him off the float. The plane was towed off as he barely made it to shore. He walked for miles while the plane was towed around the lake. When he finally recovered his plane, three of the cables were gone. The hooks on the lines that remained were straightened out, and these hooks were eight to nine inches long. There have been beluga whales that have gone up the Kvichak River into the lake, and it was possible that it was one of them. In 1977, a pilot was flying over Pedro Bay and spotted a 12 to 14 foot fish on the surface as it dove down, revealing a vertical tail. In 1987, resident Verna Kolyeha sighted seeing a large black fish with white stripes down its fin. 1988, several locals reported the same sightings from water and land, a large black fish with a fin with a white stripe swimming near the surface. It's these details that make you wonder. There are just a few more of these sightings that have occurred since the outbreak in the 40s and 50s. Most of the sightings in recent times take place near Pedro Bay and the fishing village of Illumna. Like the events of 1977 and 1988, with a lack of recent sightings, many have begun to doubt the monster's existence, although TV networks such as Discovery Channel and Animal Planet have managed to feature the monster on episodes of popular series. Yeah, I would like to also mention this point. The reason I uh, bring up this creature is another one of my damn weird is because it comes up a lot as an explanation for sea monsters. Yet, this explanation has still to be proven to exist to this degree. So, they're basically, for some reason, saying one thing that they don't know exists doesn't exist because it's actually something else that they've yet to prove doesn't exist or does exist. Close-mindedness of science sometimes. You gotta open your minds, see everything possible, trust but verify everything. Here are some possible explanations though. Many theories have been proposed to explain what might lie, might lie beneath the waters of Lake Ilamnya. Ogopogo is a cryptid with very similar to that of the Ilamnya Lake Monster which sometimes resides in the waters of Okanagan Lake in British Columbia. Some disagree with this theory based upon reports of what the monster looks like due to Ogopogo's serpent-like features. Another theory that has gained attention due to increased popularity animals show river monsters. Biologist Jeremy Wade determined that the monsters may be no monster at all, but just simply a white sturgeon, which is indigenous to the areas of Alaska. Pacific State Marine Fisheries Commission says white sturgeon are the largest freshwater fish in North America and can weigh over 1,500 pounds, be about 20 feet in length, and live for over 100 years. But they still haven't proven that that's there either. The sturgeon being a bottom-dwelling fish would explain why sightings are so rare. Additionally, catching them is considered a tough sport by many fishermen. I live here in the uh, Tri-Cities or Kennewick, on the Columbia in Washington State. And sturgeon is a standard you get when you buy your license. You pretty much have to say you don't want the sturgeon license, otherwise they include it in the price. It's so commonly fished in this area. And sometimes you'll find these monsters just like floating on the water because if they're not big enough, they can't keep them. Sometimes they just dump them then if they died while they were catching them and let the other fish eat them. But you'll find these monsters just laying on the shore. And they do look, look like something straight out of primitive, it just, they don't look normal. <laughs> Many people have reported their propellers are damaged by what looks like teeth marks, but actually might be caused by the boats running over the back of the sturgeon at the surface because the backs have teeth-like armor plating, which can easily make propellers appear as if they've been chewed on or attacked. There have also been stories of people being knocked out of their boats as it rams them and they're never surfacing again. This can be attributed to a sturgeon's tendency to jump out of the water, accidentally hitting small boats in the process. 
and dying as a result of the harsh freezing conditions in the lake itself. Strange thing, when I lived in Canada for a while, and I don't know about everywhere, this is British Columbia, I never realized, being from Washington State, living in Idaho, California, Oregon, Montana, fishing and swimming were a part of everyday life. But when I got to Canada, I found out a lot of people, most people, my kids' friends, my wife's friends, very few could swim. Swimming just wasn't. You didn't get a lot of swimming pools in Canada, not outdoor ones. And yes, it's not because it freezes, but it is getting a little cold. If you're in the water though, up there, just even north of the border, the wrong time of year, there's no reason to know to swim because if you jump into the if you fall into the water in the winter, the cold will cause you to constrict so much you won't have a chance to swim. So it really surprised me how many people couldn't swim there because it's that's how cold the water is. Of course, we said sturgeon are bottom feeders and dwell at the bottom of lakes, rivers, and oceans. Like the alumna, has a maximum depth of 988 feet, which could easily explain why they never are seen by fishermen. When they really are, people assume them to be lake monsters. And changing temperatures, even seasonally, not getting into the whole environment's falling apart issue. Fish rise and fish drop on their levels in lakes. Just depending on the season. I remember fishing bass. Depending on time of year, it would determine how low you wanted your uh, line to go and where your bobber was. Or if you're trolling, how far you would let it go so you drop so far. Same would go with any species. And as you know, it's not always the same temperature every winter. And therefore, just remember, if you're in Alaska or Northern Canada, just stay out of the water. It's too cold. If you don't end up dying in the freezing or drowning, something big may eat you. Who knows? Bye-bye for now.